Hello again. Thank, Hello. Thank you so much for coming again and speaking with me today. As usual, it's always a pleasure to see your face and your smile and to hear your wisdom that you share so easily. Um, I always love how you articulate such big concepts. So today we are talking about unconditional love, which I'm really excited to hear your thoughts about it and the promise of that unconditional love. And, um, yeah, can we maybe start with, um, I mean, I have a bunch of things written down, but what is the difference between conditional and unconditional love? Maybe we should start there, don't you think? That's a great place to start. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take over? <laughs> or shall I? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, start us okay. off. Okay, all right. Well, um, I wrote down some things. I said, um, okay, to start off with. So first of all, I think there's a lot of confusion around what love is. So love is not just a feeling. Love is actually a behavior. And I think sometimes we can get really consumed in the feelings of love, right? But um, love is also a behavior or a conscious choice. Um, when we are loving somebody, it, regardless of how we're loving them, that we are making a conscious choice to do so. And that it, it actually takes a little bit of effort, especially if we're talking about unconditional love. So conditional love, we'll start with that, right? Some of us were raised with conditional love. I know I was. Um, and conditional love might sound like this. Um, you know, I always gave you so much love and this is the thanks I get. Ouch. Or uh, your father and I wanted you to be a doctor and we've done everything for you and now we are disappointed with your choice to be an artist. Um, so conditional love comes with strings attached. Conditional love means I will love you on the basis that you reward me in doing these things for me or having these conditions around that particular gesture, right? And if you don't continue to do that, I will punish you or withdraw my love from you in some way. And in my opinion, unconditional love um, is not just boundless, right? It's not just not having boundaries and just loving. I know I call this loving everything, but loving everything um, without any consequence, right? Um, it's not just, you know, uh, the feeling of... Um, forgiving, you know, every single, uh, boundary misstep or whatever. It's, it's really, truly allowing yourself to love someone in midst of a disagreement or, um, not seeing eye to eye or a mistake or, um, uh, it's loving somebody and recognizing that they're a separate person than you, but giving freely of your love. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, okay. So unconditional love means I love you without any condition, Right. So I'm freely giving you this love, irregardless of your behavior. And there are no strings attached to it. Um, yeah, let's see. And not and loving somebody and not um, worried about the benefits that you might receive in return as well, I yes. think is also important to state. And then let's see, do I have anything else? Yeah, not, not worried about what you're going to receive in return. Okay. Is that a good start? I think that's a great, succinct primer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, good. well done. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add to the two of those? Or what your experience of that has been? Yes. So, yeah, I think you defined it well. I mean... By definition, conditional love, there is a condition that is part of that equation. Mm -hmm. And 
if that condition is not met, then the love is not there. And this is an improper wielding of this powerful magical force that is love. <laughs> it's an improper wielding. And to me, it speaks to the, the ways in which we who give conditional love must be also putting conditions on our love for ourselves, because otherwise we would love freely. Aha! <laughs> okay, that's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's my intuition about it. Um, I know the times that I have put conditions on my love, it's generally coming from some sort of insecurity in myself or um, some sort of uh, uncertainty or waiting for the other person's betrayal. So I'm not going to put myself fully out there because I know that at, at some point they're going to deny me their love. Uh, so it, it seems to come from a basis of fear or, or a need to control. Yes. Right. If I want to control my environment, for instance, if, you know, I'm afraid that my partner's going to cheat on me or whatever. I might put a lot of conditions on how I love them in order to keep them close to me or to stay or, you know, yeah. have certain expectations. And I think expectations can also really limit our ability to love people unconditionally too. Certainly. And that great example you gave of the parents who want their child to become a doctor that's a, such a classic example. It is. Because, and that's the, the parents, again, not being able to fully tap into their own inner love for themselves and conditioning their self-love on my child must be successful in this particular way. Otherwise, I can't love myself because it means that I've failed. Aha. Uh -huh. Tell me more about that. I mean, you know, that's one one possible uh, <laughs> You don't want to put any blame? <laughs> <laughs> that's one possible inner working of someone who might act that way. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, their parents put conditions on their love, so oh, that's how they were taught. For then, sure. You know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we're not placing any blame here. If anyone listening or watching has got a parent who is upset with them about their career choice, um, I can, you know, attest to my own experience of that, right? But, um, you know, I think that it does... I didn't even think about that. It does have a big reflection. How I love, okay, and I do know this because I tell other people this, that how I love, I mean, other people is generally how I'm going to love myself and vice versa. How other people love me is how I show them by how I love myself. Mm. Right. Interesting. So if I'm looking for a partner, for instance, um, and I want them to treat me in a certain way, I have to treat myself that way first. Right. Because people show up to your boundaries. People show up to your conditions of, of how you treat yourself and uh, mirror that aspect. Right. Yes. And if you have a certain standard for how you should be treated because you treat yourself that way, then if that person doesn't line up, they don't fit. Right. So I didn't even think about it from the opposite vantage, which is, you know, if I am not capable of loving myself in certain ways or in certain environments or in certain conditions, uh, then I'm going to lack that ability to do it for my child or for the partner in my life. That's right. Right? I'm going to put a lot of fences or bridges around um, how that love gets out or when it gets out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so then another question that I had written down is, is it even love if it is conditional? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start there. <laughs> what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, well, my initial thought is, 
this is one of these spaces where we run up against the the borders of language because love is a term we're applying to this enormous numinous concept that we feel so strongly we know what it is by experience but of course to try to define what it is is impossible so that's that's where my mind goes initially okay. to, so to say is this conditioned love truly love I don't know, it gets complex just on the level of terminology. Because we're trying to describe feelings. Yeah, and this this really primordial feeling or sense that that is love. Mm-hmm. I think it's a great question. I think it, it makes me reflect on that. And again, times that I've given my love with conditions attached, times that I've received love with conditions attached, and there is, there's a, a holding back or an inability to dive into the, fully into the ocean of love and trust that you'll be able to swim amidst it. The conditional love is kind of dipping toes in the water or wading up to the waist, and but keeping your guard up and thinking, oh, this wave that's far out in the distance is going to smash me in the face, so I, I can't submerge myself into the ocean of love. However, love is love, right? So the, the parent who is implying I can I cannot fully love you unless you become this person that I want you to be. There still is probably true love there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure I can't speak for every parent of a child. (laughs) No, of course not. But in the vast majority of cases, even the parents who do give those kind of conditions, I imagine that there's true love there. So do you consider love then emerging with another person? Hmm. Yeah, these are good philosophical questions. <laughs> I feel like love is the is the ground. Mm-hmm. Love is the ground. And love is the ground. Yeah. Okay. So tell me more. What do you mean love is the ground? Like the foundation? Yeah. In some sense, it's the foundation of our humanness. Okay. So if I was the sole survivor of the world and every single other human being was wiped out, love would still exist. And if every single human being, including me, was wiped out. I don't know. Would love still exist? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, because animals love each other. I mean, that's my... That's really all I go to Instagram for, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> the best use of it. <laughs> yeah. It's reels of animals loving each other, yeah. or baby animals. A mm-hmm. lot of that. Mm-hmm. And that's a good point. You know, we don't have access to the inner workings of an animal's mind, but anyone who, especially owns a dog, um, but really any pet that you establish a relationship with or even, yeah, watching animals interacting with one another. Mothers and babies or even one another, yes. You see love. Yeah. And, yeah, a skeptical person could dismiss that and say, oh, this is just an evolutionary program that we are projecting onto and saying that it's love. But come on, man, (laughs) look at how your dog looks at you and cuddles with you and, and you feel it and they feel it and you know that you don't need to have, uh, the psychological proof from the inner workings of the animal's mind. Or their conversation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
their affirmation in words. Yes. Yeah. Do you have a dog? I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I, have, I love animals. I have a cat, and my cat smiles. Like the sides of his mouth, his mouth curl up when he's feeling super loved. Uh, it's adorable, and yeah, I mean, you could say that he's just looks pleased, but yeah, essentially, yeah, he's really, really happy. When he gets really happy, the sides of his mouth curl up. It's really sweet. Okay, so um, where was I going with that? We were talking about animals and the planet and whether or not there would still be love even if you were the last person here. And so um, let's switch gears. How did you learn unconditional love? I feel like I'm ever learning it. And I feel like I can tap into it at times and other times... I have difficulty or am unable to tap into it. So I feel like I'm, I'm ever learning it. It's an ongoing process of feeling into that. That was a really honest answer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So do you mind me leaning in there a little bit more? Sure. So you're still learning it. You're still learning it. For anyone's listening, Keith is a coach, right? And we sometimes are healing ourselves while coaching others too, right? We're not perfect. I never admit to being perfect myself, but um, okay, so you find it hard to find. At times, and I find it easy to find at times. Does um, it depend on the person that you're around? Oh, certainly, and you know, because if we're talking about unconditional love and we're talking about loving everything, then we, <laughs> we, we need to look at the full scope of what we're talking about here. Okay. Like, that means loving the person who uh, has done the worst things to you in the world. That's right. Like, what, a, what an immense challenge. Right. That means loving people who commit atrocities. Yep. It's like, come on, that's that's nearly impossible but it's not impossible it's not impossible and you can look at examples of beings who throughout history who speak to this state and who live in this state and one of the greatest teachers that i've ever encountered is Thich Nhat Hanh and the buddhist monk and if you watch recordings of him speaking, you you feel the unconditional love. There is no pretense there. There is no uh, he does. He's not grasping for it. He embodies it. He yeah. lives it, or or he did. He he died a few years ago. But that man achieved this state. Yeah. And so it's possible, like. I, I've heard him tell stories of horrible things that he's witnessed or people that he's he's helped that have done horrible things and have and he's helped them come to healing through loving themselves. Yep. That's what it's about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also think when it comes to let's let's go back to atrocities, mm -hmm. right? The ability to love somebody no matter what they've done even if they haven't done it to you, but they've done it towards somebody else. So let's, let's sit there for a second. So mm -hmm. in my, in my experience that requires something called, or two things, one compassion, mm -hmm. which is another word for unconditional love is compassionate love, mm -hmm. right? And forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And I'm a believer that everyone deserves forgiveness because we all make mistakes. It's the only way that we learn. And it, it could be argued that we make the same mistakes. We all make the same mistakes a lot of times, sometimes, until we get it. Sometimes the mistake gets really, really loud, but everyone deserves forgiveness, mm -hmm. no matter what they've done. Yeah. And that's a challenging concept to wrestle with. <laughs> it is. It I is. see. Yeah. I see your face. Yeah. 
I mean, <laughs> I, trust me, I, I, I believe in it fully. Mm-hmm. I do, and I think it is the way. I think, I think it's, it's the, the only way. way through. Yeah. In order to be able to love somebody who's done something atrocious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In your own words. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even if it's been done to you, I think the only way through is by forgiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's this to to speak again to some in the Buddhist way of thought, there's this story in the Buddhist canon of this serial killer and he was called Angulimala and he would he would live along a forest path that merchants traveled and he would kill anyone who came by men women children and he would take a finger from each victim and then he wore a garland of fingers around his neck. And so he was this gruesome, gruesome person presenting this gruesome visage. And, you know, there's many different tellings of this tale, but in one telling, it was a, a very bright student who was betrayed and led astray and then ended up taking the small steps that brought him to this path of extremity. And in the story, uh, amongst all of the stories, at one point, the Buddha walks through the pathway where this serial killer has made his, his home and has committed all of these atrocities. And upon upon facing the Buddha and hearing his words and seeing the splendor of someone existing truly, purely in unconditional love, this man, the serial killer, fell to his knees, repented, and asked to become part of the the Buddhist Sangha and study and become a monk. And he did. He became this great healer. And so he, he completely transformed his life around from the experience of being met with the purity of unconditional love in a moment. Mm-hmm. And of course, this is a story and we can, we can dismiss it and say this is merely a story, but it's, it's so much more than that. It, I think it taps into a deep truth that nobody is too far gone. The most far gone of the far gone is not too far gone and can be brought back with the right condition condition of unconditional love being truly held in the presence of pure, the pure light of love. And so I love this story because it, it speaks so directly to that possibility. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the true source of healing, right, is love, right? And in and, and being able to be, like you said, you were talking about sometimes it's, it's challenging to be in, in uh, to find unconditional love. Um, I find just even with healing that it's really imperative to sprinkle in love in the places that you never received it. So with regards to your story, if somebody hasn't received the love that they need in their life, right? If that was never shared with them, either through their parents or through society or through their environment, through peers or if there were certain misgivings around their experience, if they were trapped in the worst conditions, if they were not, I mean, even a baby, they, you know, they study in orphanages. If, if a baby isn't given love, they, they essentially give up and start to die. So we know that it's, it's truly something that benefits us, but I don't think we recognize how much of it is missing not only in this world, but within ourselves at times. Certainly, yeah. And I think that, 
I can't say all problems can be solved with love, but in a sense, they kind of are. I mean, even in religious teachings, right? We go to Christianity. When you were talking, I was thinking like, you know, I was taught when I was a kid, God is love, right? Mm-hmm. Or I'm an, I'm an energy healer. I'm a Reiki master teacher. And essentially, Reiki, those two words, I mean, broken down into like English because they're Japanese, it's God's love. Mm. Prana is universal, compassionate, life force energy, life force energy, excuse me. So that energy, that compassionate love energy that I channel or that, uh, you know, you ask for in prayer or that you are asking for is essentially more love. We just don't always know that we can ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Right. And yeah, some of us are conditioned to not believe it will be there when we ask for when it. When we do ask for it, because it our experiences, been. previous experiences have been that nobody has had it for us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think about the in numerous shootings that have taken place for instance in the united states and every time i see another one i think well there was just a person who was feeling completely unattached right and um not connected and um because we talked about interconnectedness last time not connected and not loved or you think about somebody who's at the the question of suicide in their life and they're not feeling like anyone cares and that they are unloved. So many things stem to, you know, whether or not we are receiving enough love and whether that love is conditional, right, in our experience or whether it's unconditional. And I think that there's freedom in the unconditional, right? If I'm able to love you irregardless of who you are um, or how you show up in the world or how you show up with me, it's a very different feeling than it is if I'm like, you got to be a doctor, otherwise I can't love you. Mm-hmm. You got to fit in this particular framework. Um so back to that question of, is that even love or is it just kindness or not even kindness, but, you know, is it, is it the ability to care as opposed to love? Yeah. Well, I, I feel compelled to go back to a question <laughs> you, you asked go. within that, that string of beautiful words you put together, which was, uh, is there any problem that cannot be solved with love? And I'm hard pressed, I'm hard pressed to say that there is not. In other words, I, I would say, and maybe I'd have to think about it more, but in this moment, I would say that love truly can solve every problem, every single one. On the human scale, on the personal scale, on the global scale, on the political front, interpersonally, everything. Everything. Especially in our country, socially, how we're divided, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. culturally, how Mm -hmm. we're divided. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Because to love someone is to honor the fullness of their humanness. And... I love that you said that. Yeah, because a lot of, you know, you think about politicians, for example, the the archetype of the politician in this modern world. It's like the person who moves through the world using people as means to an end rather than honoring their, their inner divinity by virtue of being a human being. And, you know, or uh, the, the person or organization that makes some shoddy product that is harmful because it can make money. What 
if those people were actually facing the reality of every single person that they come in contact with or don't come in contact with, but who are, you know, voting for them for the politician or paying for their product for the, the owner of the business? What if they were truly, truly facing the reality in their own hearts of every single human being's inner sacredness? They would not be behaving in a way that degrades the human spirit. They would, they would not. However, that's a lot to ask. But what, what other way is there? What other way is there? Using people as a means to an end, that will never end well mm-hmm. <laughs> for anyone, for mm-hmm. anyone involved. Mm-hmm. But facing the true reality of the inner human spirit and the, the unassailable sacredness of that in every single person, mm-hmm. you, you couldn't behave in a way that harms or degrades, at, at least not purposefully, that harms and degrades other people. Mm-hmm. But again, it's a lot to ask. That's a lot of effort to put in. Well, I think, isn't that where humanity is essentially, we hope, evolving to? Although it's really hard to see it, but that's essentially where we're all evolving to, right? If we agree that humanity continues to evolve each generation, even on an energetic level, if we continue to evolve, right, and we believe even this idea of telepathy or this idea that we can expand our human consciousness, that we are more interconnected with each other and that we um, respond to each other in different ways. That's the way that we hopefully are evolving if we want this world to heal and repair, Mm -hmm. if we want this world to continue to grow and be habitable for our experience, if we um, don't start loving each other, if we don't start loving each other, we're going to have, we're going to have more problems on our hands than we currently do. So I think that we're all kind of getting pushed up against the wall to recognize how we are loving ourselves and how we're loving each other. Um, I think that, you know, we're starting to see how the world is unloving, too, and waking up to that. And I would even argue, and I think I mentioned this to you last time, potentially off air, but that's what I felt COVID was all about. Um, I felt that COVID initially, or, you know, at least my experience of COVID was the spiritual lesson of recognizing how we directly impact each other. And we directly impact each other, irregardless of how visual we need to make it, whether or not that means that we got to wear our mask on our face and disinfect our hands every single time we shake our hands or touch something. But making that very visible for people so that we could actually recognize that we run into each other energetically or emotionally all day, every day, and that I'm impacting you by the decisions that I make. I'm impacting you by the things that I say or the way that I treat you or the way that I hold space for you and vice versa. And, uh, you know, making that very real, I think that that's become very real for people in the last couple of years, more so than maybe the awareness around it 10, 20 years ago, is that my decisions, the choices that I make every single day, so back to the beginning of love is a choice, my decisions all day, every day, how, how am I showing up to those choices? Um, because I make them and uh, taking responsibility or ownership for making those choices more loving and unconditional. And that doesn't mean, again, to not have boundaries that are healthy and right and comfortable for you. Um, but 
it does mean to make choices all day, every day in things that are more loving to me and more loving to the people around me because that impacts, you know, and ripples out both energetically, emotionally, physically. And that's how we can repair. I mean, we've known that for a really long time. Martin Luther King, bunch of people have been killed over it, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't know necessarily where I was going with that, just that, you know, you're reminding me that, that yeah, it really truly is inner work to be able to do this act of love, of unconditional love. And um, it doesn't always come easy for us if it wasn't modeled or we haven't read, read something that has inspired us or taught us some sort of philosophy around it or some sort of education or, um, you know, if, if we grew up in an environment that wasn't incredibly loving, um, but that's something that we're having to learn how to do on our own. Yeah, and speaking to the interconnectedness of this world we live in, now that we live in the internet age, we're graced with imagery of all sorts at all times, and that also, you know, it it can have the benefit of showing people who are yearning for love, who are watching, you know, a puppy playing with a baby deer, and feeling the love inside them blossom, uh, it it can have that benefit or, but also, you know, just, just as common on Instagram as the animal videos are videos of road rage incidents or, um, people getting in fights on the street and that stuff captivates our attention too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's all in the the narrative that we want to prop up. Mm-hmm. And so you and I here and your mission with this podcast in some sense is to prop up the narrative of love. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of all about it. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and as we're speaking to in this conversation, that's plainly what we need. But there are many other narratives that are competing at the same time. Totally. Yeah. So, and what we give our attention to, this is one of the the grand understandings of the internet age that every corporation has latched onto, that attention is the currency of our time and, you know, of maybe of, of all time. Uh, so the entire internet edifice is based on advertising revenue based on attention and yeah. trying to capture attention. Yeah. And so that can lead to these narratives of like, oh, if you drive, someone's going to sideswipe you and get out of the car and start smashing your window with a bat. Or if you go into a fast food restaurant, someone's going to start a fight. And it's like the narrative that, the violent impulse or the, and even like the, the pang of satisfaction that you get when you watch one of these videos and you see someone who was starting trouble get knocked out or something like there's this, uh, interesting pang of satisfaction that people derive from that. And that's why they, they watch those videos. Yeah. I think that's just buried resentment and anger. Yeah. And so if it's buried, do we want to excavate it? And so maybe, yes, we want to excavate it so we can observe it. But do we have the awareness to observe it for what it is? Or do we get stuck in the mode of uh, like, yeah, he got his. Let's watch the next one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's all what narratives we want to prop up. Mm -hmm. And it seems plain that the narrative of love is the one that we as human beings should be investing in and propagating and 
supporting and allowing to blossom in all of its richness. Yes. I mean, (laughs) healthy, right? It's healthy for us to want to cultivate that. Um, I don't even think that uh, most of us are recognizing that we're, we're watching such video or engaging in such act that we are necessarily being and loving. Um, I think, or that we don't have the capa- capability of love. I mean, um, Charles Manson, you know, or or any serial killer that that you know, some of them had wives at home and family at home. You know, it, 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 so I think that we're we have an ability to separate, you know, or disassociate, or um, even you know, not recognize that the two are related, right? If if we have unhealed parts of us that we're not really examining or um, have awareness about, then we don't even realize that more love could be necessary or that more love could solve this for us or that we're not being loving to ourselves. And I'm not judging anyone who watches these videos. I'm just saying that we're not really being loving to ourselves or even the world if this becomes popular to do, right? If I'm putting my energy towards something that is unloving, I'm sending more energy there and you do it and you do it and you do it and you do it. That gains not only uh, algorithm and Instagram that tells me to play it more, but it also on an energetic level puts more emphasis on more of that exactly. just by the, the, the law of manifestation, right? So um, it's where we're putting our energy. It's where we're choosing again, back to those healthy boundaries. Where are we putting our energy and what are we sourcing? Are we sourcing more anger and resentment and hostility in our lives, right? That is kind of feeding and justifying the fact that we're already hurt and we're already angry and that the world is a place of suffering or are we exalting um, and gravitating towards and having good boundaries around the things that we do consider because we can gorge ourselves on love right it's very fulfilling or we can gorge ourselves on hate mm-hmm. yes. right? yeah and it's not to say that we should simply close our eyes to the reality of the the darkness that exists and, and the violence and oh yeah it's not all love and light <laughs> yeah but we can bring love we can be open-eyed and observe the full picture of the scope of human interaction and we can bring love to it rather than bringing additional malice or additional violence or any of these these lesser impulses to the picture. So how can we cultivate unconditional love for ourselves? You know, the, the self seems to be for most people, the most difficult person to love. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. Because we know ourselves so intimately. It's like, I know every way I've wronged another person. Like, you know, I I know myself so intimately because I've been with myself my entire life. Yes. I've experienced everything I've done. And so we can look at the, the fullness of our story and feel as though, oh, I'm, I'm not worthy of my own love or another person's love. And a lot of people feel this way. So how do we cultivate it? I mean, you mentioned forgiveness earlier. I think that's a key component of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Can we learn to forgive ourselves? Mm-hmm. That's an enormously effective act if we can get ourselves there. Uh, you know, there's also another idea that comes from the Buddhist way of thinking that is called metta, mm-hmm. M-E-T-T-A, and it's yes. loving kindness. Yes, loving kindness meditation. Yeah, and so people will meditate on metta. Yes. And I, I used to, um, in my... Have you practiced it? Yeah, in my as well. early middle 20s, I would go to a Buddhist center and 
and there would be a person there who would do this particular guided metta meditation. And it was so powerful because the arc that it would take was he would start with saying, imagine a, a little kitten who is, you know, in a alley in a city and is starved and helpless. Yeah. Helpless and wet with rain and, you know, just like such a sorry sight, but this just unbelievably precious little being. Imagine the little kitten and imagine yourself going up to the kitten and having it come to you and then giving it this, this meta, this sense of loving kindness. And so with a little helpless kitten, it's easy to generate that sense. So that gets the engine running, running. of that, that way of being. And then it would progress through the arc would be, you know, you start with the kitten and then you envision someone who you, you really love. And then you envision someone who you feel maybe neutral toward. Yes. And then you envision someone who you have a difficult relationship with. Yes. And then last, you envision yourself. And, and at each step along this way, you're, you're churning this energy of metta within yourself and you're directing it to each of these people and so you build up the ability to feel this and you end with giving it to yourself and i think there's some wisdom there that you know again if the self is the most difficult person to love for most people then you maybe don't just jump right in to, to trying to generate that sense for yourself. You work your way through it by working your way through people or, 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 you know, uh, beings that you already can generate that sense for. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So we were discussing the promise of unconditional love which was um, kind of the description of what you suggested as a topic, right? So what did you mean by the promise of it? I mean, I mean the, the underlying theme of what we've been talking about, which is that this is something that is truly attainable. And again, maybe it's only attainable in moments, uh, but as you continue to be in that way, it opens up further and further until you become Thich Nhat Hanh <laughs> in some way, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> but that that the the promise of it is the promise of human flourishing is the same thing. Okay. And if we're moving toward human flourishing, if that's the, the aim of the human project, which it has to be, because otherwise, what are we doing? It's <laughs> hard, you know? What are we doing, Keith? <laughs> yeah. It's hard enough just to live a day-to-day -day life and deal with the, the normal sufferings of a person without having all of these additional sufferings placed on us by malicious or misguided people, mm -hmm. you know, like that has to stop. Mm -hmm. It has to, mm -hmm. and we can get there by doing our own personal work. work to wake ourselves up, to enter into the state of unconditional love in ourselves, to generate this churning sense of meta, this alive sense of it. And then because we're so internetworked, because we're so interconnected in, in our world that we live in, as well as, you know, genetically, epigenetically, biologically, like psychologically, in every possible way you can think of, we're so interconnected. By me embodying unconditional love and moving through the world, I become an exponent of unconditional love that creates a field in which everyone that I come in contact to is affected by. 
and then they then being affected by that are touching that within themselves and then they move through the world and everyone they come into contact with and so on and so forth and this is how it works but it requires each of us to do this yes but it's real the the promise of it is real it's not some it's not some pie in the sky dream it's it's real it it is attainable but it requires each of us to do it. Yeah. So let's do it. <laughs> Keith, let's just go out and do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you're talking, you know, it's really interesting because in my own studies, um, for anyone who's listening or watching and knows something about the chakras, this was really interesting to me. So you have seven of them. Do you know anything about the chakras? Some. Okay. So you have seven of them, right? And they stop at the start at the top of your head and they go to the base of your tailbone, essentially. Okay, so one, well, actually it starts at the bottom. One, two, three. When we get to my heart chakra, we all have a heart chakra. There are energy centers in your body, essentially, that allow for energy to flow from behind you and out your body. Okay, so they go both ways and they spin. And then you have a lot of other chakras within your body. Your heart is a major one. So this is very interesting because I wasn't aware of this initially, and this might be interesting to other people too. This is the gatekeeper for the energy to flow down as well as up because there's seven. So I have three below and three above. Wait, is that right? No, wait, <laughs> did I do that wrong? One, two, yeah, three above, okay. So three above, three below. This is the gatekeeper. And if this isn't open, then the energy can't flow down. And if this isn't open, then the energy can't flow up either, okay? Or if it's restricted here, right? It, and so your chakra opens and closes based upon your feelings, or whether or not you have healing, or my interaction with you and how I feel about you, how open and closed that might be, or how much wounding I have about past experiences that then impacts how I, but irregardless, that energy center only flows if I allow it to stay open. If I'm wounded by you, I'm gonna shut it down. And so that energy can't flow through my system from top to bottom. Why, why is that a problem? Well, I don't have access to the other parts of energy that flow throughout my body if I don't allow the center to stay open. So, okay, how does that impact me? Well, when I receive information, right, from a higher source or from meditation or from uh, my higher self, uh, and I see it and I speak about it, if I don't know how I feel about it, I can't do anything about that idea. Mm. Okay, I could talk yeah. about it, I could think about it a heck, of a heck of a lot, but if I don't allow that energy to flow down to this center, energy center, I have no idea how I want to act on it because those are my lower chakras. That's how I root ideas into the ground. That's how I come to be. That's that's how I know what steps to take. Yeah. If I don't know how I feel about something, I don't know what to do about it. I'm stuck. Yeah, it makes me think about, I heard someone say recently, one, that the mind is a good student, but a poor teacher. <laughs> and the longest journey in life is from the head to the heart. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it involves speaking, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And whether or not we're able to express ourselves. Mm -hmm, because the energy has to flow down. And if we are living, you know, the ego is a great informant. It helps us move around in the world. It helps us with discernment and make choices. And all of that is great. But it's, uh, it's, it's not the true way of being as a 
person in my experience, um, I, I want to say that living from your heart center, as you would say, or from this chakra, um, really allowing this to be open, um, is a different way of being. It's a different informant. It's true. The mind can tell me a lot of things. Back to your, what was the quote? Say it one more time. Yeah, the mind is a good student, but a poor teacher. Right. And it's a great informant, but um, it, it can tell me a lot of stories that may or may not be true. And it, you know, absorbs a lot of the past, too, as an informant. So um, that can be informing me on a bunch of decisions that I'm making with my heart that may or may not be true for me. So, again, I don't. I don't really know something unless I can feel it. That's truth, at least for me, right? Is sitting in my heart as opposed to making decisions from up here. These both have to be in agreement. Yeah, I, I feel the same. And way. sometimes they're not even in agreement. <laughs> but I try to always, I won't say try, I do lead with my heart in most circumstances because that feels clear or true or truth that feels like truth um, as opposed to illusions or you know the lies that I might be telling myself yes yeah I agree the heart knows yeah. the heart knows mm-hmm. um, let's see what else I had down here uh, is it possible to love without condition <laughs> I mean that's the question <laughs> <laughs> I guess that is the question yeah I mean back to the story of like how you were raised or how I was raised and maybe we don't want to talk about um, your childhood necessarily but you know how is that how is that unconditional love uh you know, how, how did you stumble upon it? Was it something that you always knew? Was it something that you knew in your family and then was able to use on yourself? Was it modeled to you back to how can we cultivate it more? Uh, I know that somebody taught it to me, specifically taught me it. Interesting. So was it something that you inherently knew? Can you speak about your own experience as something that you inherently knew and then you've learned to cultivate it more as you've gotten older? I would I would probably say that's true. I feel like for the most part I received unconditional love from my parents and certainly as I moved into adulthood they've always been purely, purely supportive of the path that I've chosen, which feels amazing. And, you know, you can think about my grandmother and sensing into my relationship with her as a child certainly was just without question was receiving unconditional love from her. And so I, I certainly was sourcing it from places and however it has been a journey of understanding it and practicing it and that's been yeah it's, it's been a journey and it's been challenging and it's been rewarding and it's been fun and it's been eye-opening And I'm, like I said at the beginning, I'm still learning. I'm still figuring it out. I'm still walking that path and doing as best as I can to stay on that path and inevitably faltering off of that path and bringing myself back on and always striving for that ideal. You really think you're at the beginning? I I mean... Who's to say? (laughs) (laughs) It just feels... Yeah, it feels, you know, like maybe you're being a little hard on yourself there. I wouldn't consider you being at the beginning at all. Um, You know, I feel like 
maybe you could be a little more loving in that in that maybe you're not giving yourself enough credit well Uh, i don't think i'm at the beginning like i said i've been walking this path and it's been a journey of understanding um but i I don't know if there's any beginning or end to it yes i get what you're saying Mm. yeah yeah um because to me it seems to exude from you Thank you. You're welcome. So, yeah. So, um, okay. Is there anything else? Oh, I had a question here. Um, How can we learn to cultivate radical honesty in our relationships maybe when we're not feeling loved? Yeah, that's, that's certainly... An ideal that is worth pursuing as well is that radical honesty. Maybe not, maybe radical, we don't even need to put that qualifier on it, but honesty, true honesty. Um, that's certainly an ideal to strive for that's in this realm of, of loving everything. And I would say the condition from which honesty can spring forth is a sense of safety. If we truly felt safe to express the truth that we carry in our heart, then we would do so. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes that truth burns at us and we have to let it out and get it out and speak it. And, but oftentimes we're in relationships where that's not, welcome and maybe we've learned that if we are honest then we get punished or we get shunned or any number of things uh, of reactions that we don't want and so we we keep it within or we lie or we misrepresent ourselves and the, and you know, and then things spread from there. But I think that the the condition is is safety, and I, I think it probably works both ways. The condition of safety is honesty, and so they they work hand in hand. And so if we can plant seeds in either of those gardens, they're going to help the other grow. What do you mean? By without honesty, you can't provide safety. What do you mean by that? People need to know where other people stand. And people deserve to know where other people stand. And it's, it's, no, it's no fair world to live in if we're forced to constantly be assessing in what ways somebody might be deceiving us. You know, there's a lot of deception out there in the world. There is. You know, and of course, lying or misrepresenting, or this is something that we all participate in at times. Um, And some people, it, it literally becomes pathological and... Um, and some people maybe get some temporary rewards from lying and therefore they feel encouraged to continue to do it. But if we can really feel that someone is truly being honest with us, then we can feel safe because we know where we stand and their honest expression is if they're being honest with themselves, their honest expression isn't going to be uh, punitive or uh, unnecessarily harsh based on what the information coming in. If they're truly being honest with themselves and not under some kind of self delusion, then I, I believe that. So, these forces go hand in hand 
if we can feel safe, then we can feel safe to speak honestly. And if we can speak honestly, then we can help create the sense of safety that people will, will know what to expect because they know that only the truth is entering the equation. So it seems like a breeding ground or the right conditions to for love to exist as well. Um, I feel like unconditional love requires some safety too, right? Or feeling safe um, in your body, in your heart. Um, back to that, you know, if I if I don't cultivated a lot of self-love for myself it's really hard for me to give it to somebody else and maybe I haven't cultivated it because um, I don't feel safe and then secure right if I am being honest about my feelings right um, and pro providing some security or some good boundaries around that, then love can also flourish too in those circumstances. And maybe I have more propensity to have the ability to love without condition when I'm feeling safe or when I've provided safety for myself. Yeah. You know, these things are all part of the tapestry of the, the beauty of the human spirit and yeah, yeah love is the love is the ground mm -hmm. love is the ground we come back to that okay mm -hmm. um let's see if there's anything else i want to ask you uh, is there anything that you want to ask me hmm. back to you what you said to me and that I feel I feel the love in you and I feel that you you shine with the light of love and so keep doing it because <laughs> <laughs> it's important you need it. the, yeah. the, so I guess how how do you think the person listening perhaps um, can participate in helping the story, the narrative that we're trying to support here of love to, to grow and spread? Well, like I mentioned earlier, and um, I think I've even mentioned so far on a different episode, I didn't come across uh, unconditional love or the concept of unconditional love until I was in my late teens or uh, early 20s approximately. And I remember who it was. It was my English teacher who I ran into much, much later. It was my high school English teacher who I ran into much later in college um, through a community college class that I was taking over the summer. We were both taking it together, a uh, pottery class. And she introduced me to the concept of it in conversation because we were talking about something that I was experiencing in my family at the time. And to me, it was really profound to even think about it that way, uh, because I guess it had never, I, I had never uh, defined it as such, or even recognized that there was a difference. I mean, certainly I'd watched Hallmark movies or seen other people with their families and, and, it, and seen, and I'm not saying that there was no unconditional love in my family. I, I have no doubt that there is for something, right? But for the most part, I would say that most of my upbringing was based upon conditions. And so, um, you know, this concept was really new to me. So for anyone listening, it, you know, it's, it's never too late, so to speak. Uh, you know, I was much later in my um, youth to, to come across this as a concept. And so you're you're asking me like how how can someone cultivate this or how can someone spread this or why do people feel it when they come across my um, 
it, the experience of me, so to speak. Um, it was, you know, most of my adult life. I've come to this place, and most people would say that I sit in my higher heart chakra, um, which is different than your heart chakra. And I think removing the barriers between me and my heart more than anything, um, I experienced a lot of wounding in my childhood and upbringing and experience of growing up. and. I think by doing my own individual work on the things that I'm still wounded about, um, we mentioned at one point, you know, obviously it's not all love and light. I embrace my shadow side. There's parts of me that I'm not necessarily always proud of. There's parts of me that I don't always um, want to love. Um, but I do, based upon the fact that I, I deserve the, I deserve the grace. Um, and where did I come across that? I think that I, maybe through less judgment of my experience, maybe through more forgiveness of my experience, forgiving myself as well as forgiving other people. Um, Maybe just wanting to express myself in a way that brings safety to others, that safety. Um, I think also it is something that I work hard more than most people to cultivate, um, to find to come back to, to always come back to um, having compassion, to always try to or have the ability to understand where somebody else is coming from. I think because I've experienced so many things in my life, so many um, experiences, like you have too. I mean, so many experiences of um, overcoming incredible challenges or um, uh, overcoming abuse situations I think because I've experienced so much it gives me so much more compassion for other people's experience because if I haven't experienced that direct story myself I've experienced something like it and so it makes me relatable to your experience um, it's no different than why I got into podcasting to begin with is because I love stories of the human condition and I love hearing how people overcome things and so maybe that's always been inspirational for me to come overcome too or transmute that experience in some way or alchemize that experience and so um, how do I sit more in that I think it's it's coming back to where we started, which is, it's a conscious choice. It's, it's from the moment that I wake up in the morning and um, I've made a conscious effort in my adult life to surround myself with, myself with people who are more loving mm -hmm. and with an environment that is more loving to me. And going back to my cat who smiles or going back to things that do make me feel love throughout the day and I feel very fortunate maybe in the fact that I can have and have built a career around things that I love doing and uh, the food that I enjoy I love eating and the exercise that I do I love doing or pursuing you know and so I'm constantly stepping more into areas of my life and inputting more loving things. And I think that that shows. And so 
yes, it takes effort. I'm still making those choices every single day and they could be a multitude of choices. I choose not to watch scary movies. I did that in my teenage years. It didn't contribute to a lot for me, you know. Um, you know, I don't watch things that are um, really, really intense because I'm so impacted by them emotionally and energetically. I have good discernment around what is good for me at this point. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If I saw something like that on Instagram, I would swipe, or you know, I would get away from it because I just don't want to subject myself to harm or suffering. And maybe it's a conscious choice of mine that I don't perpetuate more as much as possible, and it's a conscious decision of mine to not contribute to what I've already suffered. I don't need to throw more logs on the fire because I feel like the fire, the bonfire was pretty big when I was younger. And if anything, I've been trying to find ways to extinguish it or to get more buckets of water, right? Um, and so I think that's just a real conscious choice that I made at a certain point in order to heal myself from an autoimmune condition, I recognized I got very, very clear on the fact that every choice around me was not loving at all. And I worked very hard to replace those choices with more loving things. And so I would say to anybody who's listening or watching that um, it doesn't have to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. But in having better discernment you know you don't have to get rid of all your friends but you can choose new ones and when you do they can treat you better or more loving and when you you know are choosing the food that you eat because food is nurturance food is love your relationship to food is how you love yourself it's how you feed yourself um you know I mind, mindlessly eat cheeses like nobody's business or chips, but, you know, are those choices more loving? I also balance it out with things that are more loving or make me feel more alive and more love towards myself and being caring um, or kind. Um, and, you know, that that I do, you know, you maybe people can't quit their jobs or, you know, things that they don't love doing when it comes to career choice at this time in their life, because let's face it, there are some positions that in my life, even that I haven't wanted to do, but certainly, you know, was paying the bills or, or, or making a sacrifice for that. And in my spare time, I was making choices that were feeding my passions or a goal of mine that felt more loving to help balance that out. Because again, back to that balance um, or incorporating your shadow side and being more loving towards the difficult aspects of you or the things, your transgressions, the things that you've done to other people, the things that you may not always love about you and your personality but I think the way through again is to love those different aspects as they come up and recognize that none of us are getting it all right at the same time so does that did I answer that yeah it sounds like building an infrastructure of love in one's life so that you can live live in a palace of love which will help feed the source. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because it's it's just a mirror. My experience is a mirror of what I choose to believe and what I think and how I act. I just get more of that all day long. So if I surround myself in a palace of love, then <laughs> apparently it's working, right? You feel it. Um, because I'm very gentle and kind with myself at this point in my life, and there were many, many years where I was not. So again, that conscious choice of giving myself unconditional love, even when I say that thing to my daughter that, you know, wasn't super appropriate, but I was short, short tempered or, you know, impatient in the moment or whatever, and going back and making an amends and um, 
doing a repair because I do love her and I want her to know that. And it's not about being perfect. It's about um, forgiving yourself and loving yourself even when other people are not able to, too. Right? Um, and um, making a conscious choice or effort to put in the maturity right? The maturity of, and maybe that's it too, as I've become more mature, the maturity of loving people better, loving myself better, just doing a little more each day, just getting better. We're all getting better at it. And we all have the opportunity to get better at it. And some of us will or will not make that choice, but life gets pretty difficult when you remove love out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Should we stop there? Yeah? Sounds good. Okay. Thank you again. I appreciate you. Likewise. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you for your question. Of course. And uh, I look forward to having you on again in the future. Yes. We'll talk again. Okay. Thank okay. you, Keith. Thanks.